Uh, welcome all again to the next session of uh, the Ross Industrial Conference 2020. Uh, so now we will be starting with the session regarding education. Uh, in all, we have three presentations uh, today. Uh, first up is Stefan Kalwait, uh, who is a professor at FH Aachen, and he's also leading the team MASCOR at uh, University of Applied Science uh, in Aachen. Uh, so Stefan, if you are able to share your screen, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, happy to do it. Uh, thanks, Harsh, for the for the nice in, uh, oops, introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, as I uh, yeah, as already um, perhaps uh, in a couple of uh, Ross Industrial conferences, I am happy to present some of the results of the EC project Rosen, uh, which is um, yeah a nice progen, uh, progen, uh, project 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 Rosen a project about Ross Industrial uh, and um, it was. Yeah, more, more or less um, generated by the idea that Ross Industrial is not too well accepted in the industrial environment. And uh, one idea was from us, um, and us means the Rosen team. There are a couple of, of team members I will later on present um, um, briefly, but uh, University of Delft, for instance, um, and other very famous uh, institutions like uh, the Fraunhofer as well here, the IPA is in the in our group and uh, Sue Tecnalia from, uh, from Spain at ABB um, as a robot manufacturer. Um, we decided that um, um, it's better to, yeah, to teach and to really um, generate, let's say, a vibrant um, training uh, um, community, more or less, to spread the word of Ross around. And here it's, uh, the, the title is a little bit from Ross Summer School because we have a quite yeah, well-known summer school in Aachen, which we run now since 2012, um, to, yeah, micro courses and to automatic tools to generate um, ROS contents uh, for teaching. So it's a little bit of a complete ROS teaching story. So there, of course, I'm not alone. At it. Of course not. So I'm, I'm, I have the um, great honor to present here the, the couple of slides, but there are the driving forces are more the guys who are doing the work behind. So uh, behind us, so that is uh, Patrick Wiesen, one of our guys, Alexander Verein, a colleague of mine, Stefan Schiffer, Markus Mason, and Nick Limpert. I forget Nick Limpert. Oh, oh God, uh, Nick will be, I hope he's not angry. So he, he made really a lot of very nice work. So, and um, what about, um, how does it start? Um, I already said, we, we had a summer school. We, we started in 2012, so um, with <laughs> 10 participants, uh, mostly students, which I forced to attend because otherwise they wouldn't get a good mark. So, um, <laughs> so uh, and then, but, but it evolved quite well because you remember that in 2011, more, more or less uh, all the Ross hype starts uh, and uh, sorry about saying hype, but, um, and this is really something we used for, yeah, growing bigger and bigger. And um, uh, suddenly we, we really ran out of space. So you see here in 2014, 2015, we had already 65 participants from all over the world. And um, because Ross was, yeah, becoming quite, yeah, f f um, uh, fashionable um, robotic framework, which is, which is it still um, right now. And then we overshot more or less in 2015, uh, 2016, the, really the, the, the limit of uh, what we could actually host as, um, as um, yeah, as participants, because we then just said, okay, not more than 70, because otherwise we, yeah, we, we couldn't um, have our training um, program so well adapted to the amount of participants so that we said, okay, up to 70, but not more. And then we were approached by Martin Hevise from, from University of Delft. And he said, hey, why not doing it, it all together in a kind of EC project? And that was the beginning of Rosen in 2017. And since then we are working really, yeah, Think really well together and um, yeah, and spread the Ross word uh, all over uh, the European community, and had some quite ambitious ambitious um, uh, goals. Uh, we wanted to teach more than a thousand engineers in Ross, and uh, you will see. And uh, I don't say it right now, but later on, I will a little bit explain it. Just to give you a small impression about what is the Ross Summer School. Um, um, uh, about, I just uh, show you a small 
the, I'm, um, yeah, I'm always showing, I think, but um, uh, at least you um, should have an idea um, what's actually happening in the, in the Ross Summer School. Um, I'll just give it as well the sound here so it's a little bit so you see we um, have it in a kind of uh, seminaristic way at teaching it uh, as well teaching on demand um, we have um, groups which are it's like a LAN party more or less with an, um, a special built rover and um, uh, and at the end there's a competition where uh, people can compete uh, against each other with um yeah on a, on a kind of track it's like an urban scenario it's a little bit like ducky town perhaps you heard about it and um, there are several teams then competing against each other and um, they have these slider systems on their on the robots they have the complete ross stack available Yeah, and it's um, it's not just um, yeah, it's not just the Ross Summers. It's not just about Ross, but it's about students uh, coming from all over the world, and they have their own. Yeah, you can uh, imagine their own parties, um, a lot of social um, events, and um, yeah, it's, an, it's it's really a nice community. Then at the end of the Ross Summer School, we always um, generate a kind of UAV workshop. So when you have proven that you are uh, that you can use Ross in at least two D. Um, you can try to fly with Ross, which is uh, still quite a challenging approach, but we are uh, a little bit into all this UAV technology here at the university. Uh, and then you were allowed at the last two days to dance around here with your, with your UAVs to, to calibrate them. Uh, and yeah, then you can fly uh, with Ross, which is uh, still challenging, I think, um, due to yeah, the restrictions in Ross 1. Um, as you remember, real-time possibilities with Ross 2. Um, it's a little bit, um, yeah, now um, a little bit better possible, but uh, at the end, it turns out that, um, yeah, still quite complex. So let's go back to the um, presentation. So just to get, get, get you an impression about the, the Ross Summer School. And now about the, yeah, about the, the task we had to fulfill. So we, we promised in, in Rosen that we will teach more, more than or at least a thousand engineers, so students, and, and we just put students and professionals in one just uh, big bag. <laughs> and uh, actually we, 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 we somehow managed it, but this is as well due to several facts. So now you see the overall number of people uh, trained in Ross Industrial through the Rose and EC project. And of course, there is a lot of um, um, input as well from our partners. And here are the partners. So I hope I didn't, ah, I, I forgot IT University of Copenhagen, sorry boys for, for this one. And, but they were really, uh, I appreciate really their input because they made a lot of packages more stable. They checked for stability issues. They checked for this continuous integration. Um, as well, Technalia did a very nice job, Fraunhofer, as you can see here right now. Um, it's really a, a, a nice atmosphere. ABB, we had access to the ABB kinematics. And of course, our, yeah, let's say friends from uh, Technical University Delft, um, they generated um, really nice, um, massive uh, open online courses. So you see that this was the amount of, um, yeah, um, students and professionals, the, the amount of number of people um, trained by the Rosen partners. And then ha, we were quite clever uh, in, in generating so-called EPs, educational projects, where we just spend money uh, in order that um, other uh, universities, other institutes, um, other industry partners as well were training other people as uh, students and professionals um, according to some yeah to some material we provided but they were as well 
and coverage in providing their own material and generating their own material. And that went really well. And we were really happy to have this impact of the EP. So at the end, it really turns out that you see here more than or more than 600 people were already during the runtime of uh, Rosen, which is now at, at the end um, in December, uh, Rosen is finished. Um, but we generated more than 600 just by um, uh, supporting with EPs, um, several uh, projects in, in, in France, in, in, uh, in Spain, in, uh, um, yeah, so more, more or less uh, everywhere in the, in the EC. So here you see the, the total number of trainees by EPS, so 640 uh, by EP, sorry, uh, the total number of successful EPs, so we um, granted 16 educational projects with a total amount of nearly 400,000 euros, uh, and that was really big, a big success. Um, here you see the uh, results here on the website, um, I just have to check, so where's the website here, um, you can as well check it on the Rosen website, so training centers um, on robotics in, in Portugal, in Spain, um, here in, in the UK, I'm not sure. I mean, the UK is it isn't isn't it still Europe? I, 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 no, hey, I'm joking. So uh, really, uh, really nice that we are still working together so well with the UK guys. In Tartu, here you see even in Estonia, in the Turk in in, in Turkey, and they as, as well very uh, successful virtual robotic lab and so on. So you see a lot of um, nice training activities as well. Here I, I like this one with Jupiter Lab as well. Um, Poland has a nice um, um, EP, uh, of course, uh, in the Netherlands, but they are as well very uh, just around the corner, uh, neighbors. Um, Catalonia, in Spain uh, as well, Netherlands section, uh, Ljubljana, um, so quite, quite nice. Uh, Germany as well, oops. Yeah. Um, and you can see that this was um, a quite successful, yeah, quite successful idea to use these, um, um, to use these kind of education project to generate a higher impact on uh, training uh, people. And then, um, yeah, the effort from, from the Technical University in Delft was really successful. So as you see the number of uh, total participants for uh, one of the MOOCs they ran in January, beginning of the year was 11,000. Um, of course, not everybody finished it, I think, but I guess they will as well be able to, to, uh, to talk on. Um, about it. Uh, and that is as well a very nice system where you can really um, um, yeah, work already on more or less uh, real world problems with, with Ross. And of course, you see here the, the experts, Heis, of course, Carlos and Martin and Huna and all the other guys as well. They, they provide a great input. Uh, as you know, Heis is as well very vibrant in all these um, Ross discourse things, uh, and Carlos as well, and Martin gives as well a, a nice input to these to these massive open online courses. And you can imagine that this is, especially now in the current situation, um, great, uh, yeah, just a great thing to have in the moment. Um, yep, so let's go for the, um, and you see here as well the participants from, from all over the world. So you see that you have a quite vibrant community here in, in the EC, but of course in the US and as well, of course here, yeah, India is uh, going into the, yeah, so it's more and more or less overwhelming. Yeah, so it's quite cool. Uh, and but as well in the Asian and um, yeah, Australian uh, area, but as well in the, in the South South American part. So, um, how do we let's say cope with the content? So, um, the idea, and it, of course it's not new, it's not from us, but it's of course to tailor the the contents to the need of the participants. And um, this is done by using micro courses. So by splitting. Um, our teaching material in units which do, yeah, which makes sense more or less. Um, and you see that we, we tried as well to have one, um, yeah, let's say larger program, sorry, that's German, so it's an in, 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 but let's say the, the idea is to have a kind of Ross Industrial Certified Engineer, okay? The certification is just a thing which came from us, so there's not, not yet an official yeah, instrument for certification. So there's not an uh, official institute or somebody who says, okay, it's like the um, an, um, international yeah, institute of, of, of standards or something. Um, but um, you can have, let's say a couple of courses which um, underline your skill skills or which, which train you on certain skills. For instance, one course is the Ross basic training, 
And of course, this ROS basic training consists out of several modules where the modules are as well made out of micro courses. So you see here, for instance, and the ROS file system. So you, you know, we have to start with, with the basics of ROS and the ROS file system. Yeah, it's, yeah, you need to know a little bit at, at least about it. And then you have another course for practicing ROS. And, uh, and then for instance, the course ROS application development, where you um, really learn how to program your own nodes, where um, it's a little bit more advanced perhaps than um, yeah, generating a launch file where you just have a camera node and perhaps a kind of um, 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 image processing node and you get an idea of how um, um, yeah, a simple robot can work here. And they have the different um, yeah, challenging topics. Let's, let's call it like this. And when you look at these kind of ROS micro courses, learning material, you see that you get um, um, a ROS course, which consists out of uh, different micro courses. Here you see one we generated a um, yeah, couple, yeah, so one year ago, one and a half or something, but as well ROS2, because the demand, of course, from, from people from industry was, was uh, ROS2, because it was um, one, one of the acceptance of ROS is as well the real-time possibilities. And you have a lot of people in the industry who say, yeah, we would like to use ROS, but ah, real-time, and it's not real-time capable. And then when ROS2 popped up, um, um, a lot of people say, yeah, now it's the time to go for ROS2, and then we had to react. And of course, a lot of things are very familiar to ROS1, as you might know, and there are some news uh, in ROS2, um, and then we use the chance to, yeah, use, um, uh, to do as well a lot of um, a micro courses or generate a lot of new teaching material for ROS2. And this is quite, um, the industry is, is, is a little bit like this, yeah? Even if it's the same package in ROS1 and it's just renamed, they, they like to have it in ROS2 and then uh, have this uh, uh, more or less real-time capability. So you see, these are the, then the, the ROS courses and um, the next are these, these courses are then um, structured in some modules. And of course, then you see um, these, um, yeah, some other chapters here of the, of the, um, of the learning material. And um, 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 yeah, it's, it's a way of combining, let's say the contents in a, in a more or less uh, clever way. Um, so for instance, here, so you see that um, the, the micro causes, the, um, the, um, the uh, teaching material here, and then um, uh, it comes down to uh, the explanation of single ROS packages. So if you um, now dive deeply into the development of uh, ROS code, so to write your own first node, um, then it comes really to get in touch with um, the details of a ROS2 package, um, how you install things you know from the basic ROS courses, um, um, which you did before, but then um, you are as well, for instance, supported by some Git tutorials. If you don't know how to use Git, which is of course, uh, yeah, so everybody knows how to use Git. Um, but um, even if you are not completely familiar with it, and um, believe me, there are a lot of people, especially in the industry environment, who are not familiar with all the open source tool chain. And from time to time, they really have to get some um, information about it. And so uh, at the end, here you, you have the possibilities to uh, at the end provide them with some additional information. So you see here, perhaps a couple of, of example courses I uh, just want to show. Um, and so we had the MOOC already, but um, as well, oh, it's difficult to say. So for instance here, um, as I said, um, we even <laughs> start with, with very basic tasks. So uh, navigation in Linux, for instance, why? Because as I said, a lot of industrial, um, yeah, industrial partners, they don't use Linux every day. So for you, uh, I think you, for you, you're very familiar with it, but um, even my students, uh, a lot of these students, they are yeah, bound to Windows and they have no idea how to use something on the terminal anymore um, or to, to, to just open a file or to, to write in a file just on the terminal, on a, com on a command line in the terminal system. And here you see that we start really with basic tasks and with these kind of micro courses, you can really tailor it to the needs of uh, the people who, who you are, yeah, who you are training. And this allows us in, in with, as well with an automatic tool called Crosscut. Um, um, uh, Sasha Fein and the other guys, they, 
they published it recently uh, to even automate it with a simple uh, engine which generates out of the micro courses uh, a new course, which is quite nice. And as well, um, when you now go for the Ross Academy, you see here, um, it's then a little bit more complex um, contents. Okay, you know, that's, uh, okay, that's done. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, another nice course is this one here, uh, generated as well quite recently. That was in 2020 when yeah, we had problems with Corona. As you know, still here, I would like to be more or less more in, in front right now, but yeah. Uh, it's uh, more or less impossible. Uh, Ducky Town, so that was, um, perhaps you, you heard about it, and I don't present it here right now, but then um, we uh, generated as well an own Ducky Town and an own teaching material for Ducky Town, um, which um, uh, several, or which use sim um, similar hardware um, and which uses as well ROS2, for instance. Um, then for people who are really doing this education and, and training, um, we generated some guidelines, which were like a kind of um, how to generate um, teaching context, context that is especially um, essential for people running EPs. And um, yeah, and um, just to stop this one here. So you see um, at the end, so that was, um, that was guidelines for generating training material so that people can really um, as well tailor our, yeah, our material to their needs. So um, at the end, um, just to summarize, and then I'm ready, sorry, two minutes, uh, two minutes over time already, uh, summary of the teaching activities. So it turns out that micro courses um, were uh, quite successful and um, yeah, make sense because then you can tailor the contents to the need of the audience. And if somebody is not able to work already on the terminal uh, in Linux, you can just uh, give a small course to him and then he can be uh, up and running. And um, we were even, it's not that we are too lazy to generate our, um, our courses anymore, but automatic tools allow to really tailor as well these courses in a new way uh, of um, yeah, generating training contents where perhaps you're not able to do it manually anymore. So down to the last second, perhaps even. And we have a strong multiplication of strong multiplier effect due to the EP. So thanks again for all the people who as well apl applied for the EPs. Uh, and now are doing a very nice job in training and teaching people. And I think that is really the, um, yeah, you can say it's really a successful story, a story uh, leading uh, to a larger acceptance of ROS industry. And that was the aim of this Rosen project, of the EC project, to make ROS industrial, yeah, known um, and, uh, and, and spread it quite wide and large to the community and even to uh, industrial um, partners, which were not, uh, already, yeah, in contact with Ross before, and I think that was um, that was, um, yeah, we, we 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 yeah we received this goal, and we um, yeah we trained more than a thousand people uh, on uh, on Ross with with on Ross Industrial with uh, in, inside this EC project, and that is I, I think a quite quite big success yeah for for the complete team, yeah, and I uh, I was. Uh, uh, I was allowed to present it here. So thanks again for all the trainings, for the possibilities to train the people as well for the support from um, yeah, a lot of you as well, for instance, IPA. And yeah, perhaps we have time for a question, perhaps one. So that's, that's it from my side. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. It was very interesting to see uh, the training activities conducted by Rosen. And I can surely say that uh, Rosin was very in, uh, instrumental in providing uh, yeah, trained engineers to the industry uh, where it demands more and more uh, skilled trained engineers. Uh, so I'll take the questions probably at the end of the session. Uh, we'll now switch to our next presentation by uh, Ricardo Teles. Uh, so he's the CEO founder of uh, the Construct, which is an online uh, training platform. Uh, and he would be presenting uh, the topic, how to teach ROS worldwide. So Ricardo, if your mic and camera is working, the floor yes. is yours. Is it okay? Yeah, it's working fine. Great. Hello, everyone. So let me switch now to my screen to share first. Share the screen and then let's start the presentation. Great, so 
um, what I'm going to present here is about our experience of teaching ROS around the world. And uh, the things that I'm going to present, they have been used by many universities around the world from east to west. You can see here just a, a sample of them. And you can see it covers all the, all the continents around the world. In the world. And uh, also I have taught myself using this methodology at the University of La Salle here in Barcelona. I was using this at Roscon in 2019. And also I was teaching on a summer school in 19 in, in China. It was a raw summer school there. And well, yeah, so what's my experience about uh, learning ROS first? I started learning ROS when there was the sea turtle version of ROS. It was back in the 2011. So that's when it was about to, to get uh, released the uh, Diamondback, ROS Diamondback version. And of course, in order to learn this, what I did was to use the ROS Wiki. That was an excellent tool for learning. I can tell you, I, I have to repeat that. So it was breaking all the standards in documentation that we can, could find at that time in the, in the robotics world and all, even in the, in the coding world. Actually, I would say that it's also breaking the standards in the, today because most of the projects around the world, they don't have such a nice documentation for learning. And I think, I, I think that one of the main reasons for the success of ROS was especially the ROS Wiki. It was excellent. Well, that was the, at that time, the typical approaches for learning ROS was to use the ROS Wiki, go to YouTube for videos, if there were any at that time, and uh, use blog posts, basically. The, the main problem that I found in that way of teaching was the lack of practice. So what that means is that you have to uh, go to the wiki and read the tutorials, try to understand. Then you, can, you could uh, create some programs and use a kind of 2D simulator, kind of. It was a turtle sim. It, it was just a turtle moving around, but it was quite obscure. So we, we couldn't see really how to apply what was on the tutorials into something that makes sense in robotics, practicing with robots. And then uh, that's when we decided at the, at the construct to, to create this new way of training, which is based on practice. So we concentrate on practice and practice with robots, not with uh, numbers. What I mean by numbers is that, uh, okay, so creating a, let's say a ROS node that communicates with another ROS node by sending a number from one place to another. Okay, that's nice. So I can understand the concept of that, but what does it mean, what it does it mean for robots? So we want to teach that. We don't want to teach about concepts per se, per se. So just uh, because, okay, what is a topic or what is TF? No, we don't want, we want to avoid that unless it is necessary. So what we want to teach is, I want to move the wheels of this robot. I need to transform the data captured by this sensor in this frame, and I need to transfer to the base frame, let's say. Okay, then, oh, that, then those concepts, topics, TF, that those concepts, they make sense in the, in the learning of ROS. Okay. Then that's uh, an approach which is uh, being uh, explained and, and basically promoted by Seymour Paper, one of the leaders of uh, artificial neural networks at the beginning. Actually, I would like to recommend this book from him. It's very interesting about uh, Mindstorms. It's about how to teach computer programming to, to kids and why that's important. And it follows this approach about constructivist constructionism. Great. Then, okay, it's based in practice. So how could, do we provide practice to the students? Of course, by using simulations. Yeah, because I mean, we don't have the chance to have uh, so many robots, different types, even one type of robot. Many of the people doesn't have this option, many of the teachers. So let's use simulations. Uh, they are great and they, they can uh, show any, any type of robot there. Then, um, the, if we want to use uh, simulations, then we have the problem 
of oh, this simulation doesn't work on my computer. It works on the teacher computer, on this student computer, but not on the others, especially because many of the students, they don't even have a Linux there. Then the idea is to use a web-based environment because then the students doesn't have to install anything in their computers. It doesn't matter which type of computer they have. And this problem is solved, like in the example here on the, on the video. Great, for that purpose is where we created the Robot Ignite Academy, which is a web-based academy, which is online. You can find it there if you are interested. And then we provide those courses that are web-based, based on simulations and uh, yeah, the, the many, several subjects there. Uh, basically what we do is to divide the, the screen into different sections. One is the section with the notebook that contains the lessons together with practice. I'm going to go back to this in a minute because it's very important. Then we have the IDE, the terminals, Linux terminals at the bottom, and of course, the simulation, the simulation running, already running for the students. And so how, how do we work, the normal work? Okay, so how does it goes? How does it works the normal flow in this academy is, you read the book, the notebook that contains the concepts. And inside those concepts, every time that you are uh, teaching to the student how to do something, you have to do it. And the student has to do it and see the result on the simulation. So just the small things, a small part. Okay, do that, then do that. It's always the, the, the approaching, the teaching approach is always like this. You do that, then you do that. And then you are getting in your mind the idea, the concept, because you see the result on the real robot, on the simulated real robot. Then at some point in time in that uh, notebook, the student is going to find an exercise. The exercise is different. The exercise is, okay, so you have learned all those concepts that you have been practicing. Then now do this exercise by applying those concepts into solving this exercise. And that's something that they do have to do by themselves. If you are a teacher and you are teaching about using the notebook for, as a slide, you can be telling them to do those exercises, but then when it reaches the, the actual exercise, sorry, this is the practice and this is the exercise. When the, it reaches the exercise, is the student on his own that is he has, he has to solve this exercise. Of course, he's going to ask a lot of questions because things doesn't make sense sometimes to, to him. Then this is where the teacher can provide a lot of value, supporting the student on the questions and why he cannot apply the, the previous concepts to that solving this exercise. Then also we include a full project in every course. So remember, it's a lot of practice. First, practicing on the concepts, then practicing on exercise itself, and then a full project. The full project is a project that makes uh, the student apply the whole content of the full course into a single problem, into uh, making the robot do something. And he has to apply all the concepts that has been learning along the whole course. So this is kind of wrapping everything into that. And uh, finally, the final thing that we include are the exams. We think that the exams are very, very important in order to make the, the students stress to apply. This is like the final uh, twist of the, of, of, of the, whatever it says in English, then uh, is the final twist in order to make them learn under pressure. And these are very, very necessary. That's why we include. And these exams that we provide are self-corrected. So the, you, you press a button and then it, it runs some algorithm that is uh, correcting the exam. Why that, is that possible? Because our exams are based on practice. It's not about asking questions, but making the students do something with the robot, applying the, the concepts. So this method is, is very well suited for independent students. So we have a, a student from, I don't know, from Malaysia that wants to learn about ROS. So it's perfect. They go to the to this uh, website and then they decide which course to do and they, they do it. 
by themselves. Everything is self-guided. And then you, you may say, oh, but yeah, but everything is done. So why do we need the, the teacher there if I want to use this for teacher? Oh, that's even better because you as a teacher, you don't have to prepare anything. Everything is already prepared there. The only thing that you need to do is to teach as a teacher. And uh, this is an example. So it provides you your slides already done, the exams already done. And the only thing that you have to be there to do there is to explain to the, the students to support them when they are practicing, especially when they are doing the exercises, when they are doing the project, especially in those situations. And in the other situations, then explaining and doing at the same time that they are doing. So as you can see, it's a full method based on practicing all the time, all the time. Then as uh, also, oh, there is a problem here. I don't know why. And uh, as, as Stefan has mentioned previously to, to me, uh, we also found, okay, yo, here, wait a second. So we found also that the students, they don't know about Linux. They don't know about programming. It's even programming. So we had to create uh, also a couple of introductory courses that are going to prepare their students uh, before starting to attempt uh, to learn ROS because they need to know at least some basics of Linux and some basics of Python 3. You can find here the, the links for doing those courses. They are completely free and they are also based on the same method. It's Python for robotics because it's how to apply, I don't know, a dictionary to a robot in order to capture all the locations well, it is navigating the names of the locations and the coordinates, for example, I don't know. And the same for Linux for robotics. It is everything applied to a simulated robot? So we figure, kind of figure it out how to apply this to a simulated robot. You have to, to have a look at those courses. They are very, very nice. Then another problem that we found is that the students, they didn't know where to start. So we provide those courses and then they come to the to the academy and they don't know what. Okay, that, that's when having learning paths for very specific goals are very important. Uh, we have one about code foundation, for example, which is the one that teaches you the basics before attempting ROS. It's Linux and, and uh, yes, and let me see, we have some, yeah. Okay, then uh, also for ROS for beginners, navigation, machine learning, etc. So they are group and then you can see a sequence of different ROS uh, courses that uh, they, they are one after another, providing this guidance to the students. And then another one, okay, so here we hear some, so noise, the final is that the students, they didn't have any real robot practice because everything was on simulation. So then is when we created this uh, Robox, it's a real robot remote lab, which is open 24 seven, and that any student can connect from anywhere in the world. Right now, actually, if you go there, you will see the live feed from here, from uh, it's beside here where I am. And it's a real robot lab where you can practice with real robots. Of course, it's only one robot. You have to schedule and it's limited to the possibilities of this robot, but that's very nice real robot practice. Then uh, when we were applying this for remote teaching, we saw that there were some things that we need to adapt. So the first one is to provide of our question and answer. So that's why we included also a forum. This is very important to include a forum where students can provide us questions. And also another problem for the teachers especially is about controlling what the students are doing because they are remote, they are not there with, in their own class, in their own room. And so they are kind of lost on, on what they are doing. So we included this control panel that specifies for every student how much they have been doing for which course, which unit, the amount of time, any exams taken, certificates, et cetera. And, uh, then there, in this point, there is a problem on the copying of the exams because they are remote and then the students, they can talk to each other without you knowing. Then in that case, we are preparing, this is not done, but we are preparing one thing that is called exam randomization. So the students doesn't have the same exam all the time. 
And uh, basically that's our experience teaching ROS around the wall. And I hope that this helped you to understand how is the situation and what a little bit more about this uh, thing about constructionism, which is based on practice. And personally, it allowed me to learn a lot faster. That's the method that I feel the more that goes with my, my own being, let's say. So then thank you very much for the time and I'll be happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ricardo, for a very, very interesting presentation. A uh, very new approach to training students on ROS. I think uh, this kind of takes the students out of the monotonous uh, classrooms and yeah, make them do stuff rather than just look at a board and try to do some repetitive uh, exercises. So quite impressive. Thank you. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end. So okay. the next and the last session for the education session is by Jack Riley, uh, business development manager at Amazon Web Services. Uh, he'll be presenting about robotics education. So. Okay, welcome to the AWS session on robotics and education. I'm Jack Riley, I'm the business development manager for AWS RoboMaker and Education. And joining me today is Camilo Biscarin, our Ross evangelist. Uh, super excited to be pr presenting today at Ross Industrial and, and totally honored um, to be presenting with Stefan and, and Ricardo. So let's, let's get started here. Um, as you're probably aware, the use of robotics is growing uh, due to technological advances uh, that support an increase in the number of applications for ro robots. Uh, industrial robots have been around for several years. As, again, as you know, fixed robotic arms have been used on the assembly lines and manufacturing facilities since the mid-70s. Um, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen strong growth in commercial robotics. Um, for, for example, use of collaborative and autonomous robots even in our warehouses. Um, in a report earlier this year, the Inter International Federation have, of Robotics has forecasted that almost 4 million industrial robots are expected to work in factories worldwide um, in just two years, 2022. All trends point to strong growth in autonomous mobility in the next few years. There are specific industries we see robotics playing a super important role. Uh, obviously, logis logistics, construction, retail, hospitality, healthcare, agriculture, energy, oil, gas facilities, um, and even consumer home products like your vacuums. Um, each of these demand more autonomy and more intelligence from the robots that are actually operating in them. Uh, these robots play a vital role in automating the production, to speed up post-corona economy, and at the same time are driving a demand for skilled workers. Education systems must effectively adjust to this demand. In an article focusing on growth dynamics for the robotics industry, the global management consulting company McKinsey referred to the need for robotics education as a license for operating in the future. McKinsey's advisory or advice, I should say, has gone on to note that the responsibility to manage this large scale shifting capabilities lies with robotics companies, governmental bodies, and educators, um, essentially all of us right here. Growth and ro robot use has created a demand for skilled labor. In another report on industrial robotics, McKinsey cited three growth drivers for industrial robotics. The first was the availability of talent with the requisite knowledge to bring robots online. Training at scale is critical for individual workers, companies, national economies alike, professionals, students, creating value and ensuring competitiveness in the future for all of us. As mentioned earlier, by 2022, operational stock of robots, almost 4 million is just awesome. But these robots will play a vital role in automating production to speed up, again, our post-corona economy. According to an automation readiness index published by the Economist Intelligence Unit, 
only four companies, or I should say countries, have already established the mature education policies to deal with this challenge. South Korea is a category leader, followed by Estonia, Singapore, and Germany. Countries like the Japan, US, and France are developed, and China was ranked as emerging. The EIU summed up the order of the day for governments. More study, more stakeholder dialogue, and international knowledge sharing. Governments and companies around the globe must focus on providing the right skills necessary to work with robots and intelligent automation systems. And this is our call to action. The education, the robot, robotics education market is currently a $1.3 billion market and is set to grow to about 3.1 billion by 2025. The market is comprised of instructional programs, physical platforms, training, and educational resources. Um, there is no one size fits all. I think Stefan mentioned that uh, for robotics education, nor a single cohort of learners to focus on. Instructional technology, curriculum, and the pedagogy need to fit the learning objectives and ultimately the needs of the learners at many levels and ages, both professional and students. The IFRs recommended that robotics, OEMs, and system integrators should focus their promotional activities on convincing companies, governments, and societies at large for the fact that robotics related training at scale is critical. This focus must also occur in our academic institutions as well, starting at, K, at going to K-12 to doctoral programs as well. We must work to ensure robotics courses are integrated within engineering and computer science disciplines, and we must expand offerings to include robotics in undergraduate majors and graduate programs as well. The AWS RoboMaker EDU program was created about 18 months ago. Since its inception, we engaged educators to gain insights into the robotics education landscape. We refined our focus to undergrad and graduate programs, which is where the robot operating system, ROS, and robotics application development are predominantly being taught. By partnering with AWS Educate and pursuing several key strategies, the program is on a path to help democratize robotics and provide support to the Ross community. Working with Dr. Alberto Quattrini Lee, an assistant professor, computer science professor at Dartmouth, an autonomous mobile robotics researcher, AWS RoboMaker is offering a cloud robotics curriculum through its AWS Educate platform and AWS Robotics GitHub. The curriculum is aligned to the AWS RoboMaker platform and an NVIDIA Jetson Nano based robot offering by WaveShare designed to be extensible for the education market. The combined curriculum, AWS RoboMaker platform and robot offering will lower the barrier to and democratize robotics education by providing introductory level curriculum and access to AWS RoboMaker at no charge to educators and students and make available a personal robot offering for less than the cost of a college textbook. Let's look at each of these components. First is the curriculum. It's comprised of eight modules and we have a backlog forming, which include the fundamentals, getting ready, ROS2 basics, simulation, deployment, and a robotics application development project. The first three modules are built and available as badges in our AWS Educate platform, and they're also in our Git repository. And we've secured funding to complete the balance. The curriculum will be open source as we want it to be a resource for the community used for guided learning as well as modules to support an existing curriculum. Next, we have the AWS RoboMaker ROS2 JetBot. For the robot, we commissioned WaveShare to build out their current JetBot SKU 
and offered extensible learning platform comprised of a camera, LIDAR, speaker, and mic. We're also making simulation easy by including simulation models. NVIDIA is a sponsor of this initiative. Lastly, we're leveraging the core components of the AWS RoboMaker platform. RoboMaker's Cloud9 based IDE supports the ROS Kinetic and ROS Melodic releases and also support for ROS2 dashing. AWS has also built cloud extensions to its AI services in the AWS cloud, which makes it easy for a ROS based application to call on these AI services. RoboMaker brings cloud scale to simulations. Benefits include the ability to run hundreds of concurrent simulations with the RoboMaker batch API, fully managed AEWS infrastructure, which enables you to run your simulations consistently and reliably with by the minute pay as you go pricing. Education is free, as I mentioned. You only pay for the simulations when you're using them. You get the benefits of a managed service with Ross Gazebo built in, which will free up engineering resources. And finally, the ease of integration with the breadth of AWS services. You connect your Ross application and tooling with services like CloudWatch and AWS Code Pipeline. The RoboMaker service leverages AWS IoT Greengrass technology for fleet deployments, making robot deployments easier by putting you in control of the deployment scheduling. For a deeper dive on AWS RoboMaker, plan on attending my colleague Matt Hansen's presentation tomorrow. So what's your call to action? Uh, we've got five, five items for you to pursue coming out of the session. First, our robotics blog provides more detail on the curriculum and its location on AWS Educate and GitHub, and I've provided a link to that. AWS Educate, as I mentioned, is Amazon's global initiative to provide students and educators with the resources needed to accelerate cloud-related learning. And there's a link there to get on to AWS Educate. The ROS2 reference robot is available um, from Waveshare. At this point, it could be available from um, other sources um, soon. Uh, there's a link to Waveshare there. The RoboMaker platform details are available on the RoboMaker site. And then lastly, um, there's a link here to a recently announced uh, initiative by AWS. So watch the interview with Teresa Carlson, our VP of Worldwide Public Sector on Amazon's investment in cloud computing recently at, at reInvent. Um, the goal is to teach um, 29 million people in the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jack, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, definitely the need for uh, robotics education has been uh, tremendously increasing over the years and uh, I, I must say Rosen, Construct and AWS, all three are doing an amazing job to uh, bridge this gap. Um, so let's try to take some questions. Uh, so all the questions probably I'll uh, put up to all the three speakers. So if Stefan, you also can come in. Yeah, and Nicole, could you take the panel, please? Uh, so the first question is, is there a different path for students and professionals in your education? And what about uh, online training uh, example provided by Udacity? Uh, probably we can follow the same sequence that is uh, Stefan, Ricardo and Jack. Okay, then, then I just make it as quick as possible. Yeah, that's definitely different between uh, students uh, teaching and uh, professionals. Um, we, we all, I think we all agree on um, that the industrial environment has not the same possibilities like the student at the, at the university level. So you have to have different approaches um, to, let's say, convince somebody who programmed a robot, let's say a KUKA robot or something else, for 10 years, 20 years, um, uh, you have to convince them to use ROS <laughs> uh, and to use MoveIt and to, um, let's say, 
I don't say throw away all the knowledge about the um, standard robotics programming language and then move to ROS. So there's definitely um, a difference. I don't know how the other guys are seeing it, but uh, but uh, Jack, nice thing. 29 minutes against 1,000 or a little bit more. Thanks for this one. <laughs> That's a good plan. Ricardo, your thoughts on this? Um, I don't know if I understood correctly the question. It's about the uh, the difference between learning by students or, and by teachers. Uh, not like really. So basically, no. Uh, they are asking for uh, students who are studying in the university ah. uh, versus professionals who are already working in the ah, industry. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah, then in the difference is uh, with the students, they, they have it easier. They, it's like a stray, they, they, are, they don't know what to expect. For example, one of the difference that we have detected is that they, they want to use the latest ROS, uh, ROS distribution, you know, because they, they want to be at the, up to the point, up to the, the, the thing that is the more modern. On the other side, on the industry, they don't even know with which one they have to start with because maybe they need some uh, functionality that is not still available into their for, for their robot specifically. And because they don't know all ROS, they don't know how to select. So they get, got a little bit more confusion. Also, I would say that uh, as, as, uh, as indicated by Stefan, that uh, they are more, they are more, uh, like they don't like so much to, to get into the new things. They are used about the, the things that they have been doing and it is working. So there is a, a, a big resistance against going into the, the, the new things like ROS. Even though we have detected in our case that several companies, they are start, started to learn ROS from one of those of their engineers and they are companies that when we check them they are not robotics companies they are other type of industry companies that uh, it's it looks like they want to get into the robotics field and they yeah. have to search and found this about ross and they are exploring so they get into our academy and say oh what can i well, how can i learn this and then they go on the path so I think that those are the, the thoughts that come to my mind right now about that question. Uh, Jack? Yeah, if I could just add, um, it, it, it totally agree with, with Ricardo and, and, and Stefan here. I, I would like to say that um, the, the cloud is a great enabler for education both at, for students and for professionals with some similarities and, and some differentiators as well. Um, I, and I think it was Ricardo mentioning, um, with the cloud, students don't need to worry about um, their devices, the type of devices, installing ROS, Ubuntu, and so on. I go to a browser and I'm in the environment. And, and that is just a great enabler to getting onto uh, or getting beginning your education in, in ROS. Um, it's also a great enabler for um, robotics development companies to expand their ability to run simulations, not just single simulations, but on, on tens or hundreds of robots in parallel. And those are capabilities that they just can't do um, on premise. From a student perspective, we have uh, modules that build on each other. Um, for professionals, they're going to come in with some knowledge um, and, and they're going to want to jump into and maybe focus on simulation um, in the cloud. Um, professionals are coming in with on-prem knowledge and, and there are some change management challenges in getting them into the cloud. Um, and certainly, certainly seeing that. Um, and we, uh, we see with the professional learners, um, we are integrating with their on-prem um, software development call it pipelines, and where those pipelines can access um, AWS robotics through APIs. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see much uh, questions in the chat, but I might have few from uh, my side. Uh, so there are definitely among the panel, we have uh, uh, speakers who have been teaching ROS 
uh, or leading the ROS trainings for quite some years now. Uh, so I'd just like to know, uh, according to you, how have the uh, needs and demands of the students, uh, students, I mean, university students and the professionals uh, who want to learn ROS, and from the other side, uh, the industry, uh, what kind of skills they demand. So how has those things uh, changed over the years? Uh, okay, so then, um, yeah, I'll start again. Uh, we found out during the Ross Summer School and as well, because we're teaching at the university um, on yeah, bachelor level already, so we all go into Ross. So we, I just skipped everything else and we're just going into the Ross world. So what I found um, essential is uh, the practicing, so practice work. So as Ricardo said, and as well, Jake, um, uh, that they have a hands-on robotic experience. So you can do a lot of simulation, you can do a lot in the, in the cloud, and, but it's really something different when you crash your robot into a wall or something. Of course, you should start with simulation, be sure that you understood what you're doing, and then you need to really have the hands on because you can still, it's difficult to simulate everything. So a, a proper laser scan match map looks always very clean and nice in the simulation, but in reality, ah, yeah, your sensor is going into, uh, or has some, some noise and so on. And what I found out is as well, um, support by teachers. So the Ross Summer School, for instance, we have really a lot of tutors, as you remember, harsh, so it's like modern slavery. Uh, so we have, we have, I don't know, for 70 participants, we have 35 uh, tutors uh, supporting them. And this is as well something that you can ask somebody. Uh, the community, I think, and this is, I think, as well, one thing about Ross, which I really, really love, is the community. Answers at Ross.org is something where you can really post your stuff and you get always really some, some useful answers. And it's a very vibrant community. So I see this is, this is really something on the university level, which is fantastic. So, and... The professionals, they're not even used to it. So they are not used that somebody's answering your questions in the middle of the night because a nerd is still hanging around uh, in front of his Rosenhut and answering a silly question. Uh, and this is really true for uh, the, let's say, the, the university nerd environment. Uh, and I think uh, professionals, they have to learn it as well. And uh, perhaps just one remark is as well, these real-time capabilities, I think that could really open up a complete new market for Ross industry because I always find people who are um, willing to use Ross but the, in industrial environments, but they are struggling with these kind of, yeah, it's not completely real time and so on. So as soon as we have really these, um, yeah, if we have a proven real time capability, then I think the, the, the gate is completely open for, for industrial applications. I like this last comment, Stefan. Very good about the yeah, about the the when when we have this uh, real time system working perfectly uh, well, perfectly good enough, then it will be open. That's very interesting. I didn't know about that. And then related to the question, um, do you think that we have at uh, least I have observed in the uh, from the students some years ago, let's say five years ago, and now is uh, that at at the beginning, uh, they wanted to learn ROS. So they came to the academy or to, they came to us because they needed to learn ROS. And then they, they were looking for some place to learn faster and whatever, better, let's say. Now, the difference now is that the, the students, they come because they want to do some things in robotics. And they have heard that this is the the tool to use. So it's it's kind of different. It's like before they knew already. So they, they I want to do this and that. And then for, for that, uh, maybe if I use ROS, it's a better framework. And now it's like, okay, I don't know about anything about frameworks, but I want to do this. How can I do that? Then they look around there and then they find, oh, ROS is the tool you have to use. Okay, then let's go and learn ROS. And it's kind of different. I think that is a little bit different. Before, I, I presume that before was that way because we didn't have any frameworks before. And then everybody was doing their own things. And 
Yeah. And then they, at some point in time, they discover ROS and they say, oh, whoa, that's the thing that I have to learn because it's going to simplify my life a lot. And now, the, so the framework, the ROS framework is very mature. So it's, it's like a tool that you can use and it's, it's powerful enough to solve my problem. So I would say that this is the difference that they have noticed. Yeah, quite some interesting points, Ricardo. Uh, Jack? If you have yeah, that. sure. Um, as you know, a lot of our experience has been with um, universities, so with professors and, and their assistants um, and students. And, and the, the big uh, uh, request is, is make it easier. Um, I think they started with make it easy. And um, robotics is hard. Um, and, but we're going to try to make it easier. Um, they want it, educators want a curriculum. They want a guide, a guide to follow. Um, and so we, we, um, address that to Ricardo's point, super important, this iterative education process. I want to go into some code. I want to go into a node. I want to change an algorithm. I want to see that change in a simulated robot is an incredible accelerator to learning robotics, um, super important. Um, the use of a simulator is super important, especially right this minute when we have most of our students sitting at home without the luxury of having the, uh, you know, the $1,000 or $10,000 robot in a lab down the hallway that they can access. Um, the other thing we heard and, and related to that is give us or make available, not give, make available a low cost robot that is actually aligned with the curriculum and it's ROS2. So that's where we thought a partnership with, with Waveshare would help out here. So forget the college textbook, take your money, buy the bot. And now you've got something tangible that actually you can take your code that's running a simulation, download it and have it run physically in front of you in your apartment, in your dorm without having to go to the lab. So those were our learnings. Uh, quite some interesting points from all the three speakers. Uh, I have one more question um, in the chat. Uh, so definitely uh, AWS and uh, even ConstructSim is trying to uh, teach by making the students do rather than just uh, uh, yeah making them watch slides. Uh, but still, uh, I think most of the part will be probably they'll be working on, uh, let's say, simulations. Uh, so out of this entire training, uh, what experiences uh, can the students take back uh, to their jobs, to their uh, universities to actually build um, some, let's say, application on field? Oh, let me start in my case. So I, I don't know, we see also for, so this is uh, for Stefan also, I don't know. I'm not sure, but in any case, so let me take the lead because you have been taking the lead on the others. So yeah, so in, in our case, uh, um, what we provide is based on simulations. So it's, uh, let's say 90% is based on simulations. And in, it depends on where you want to, to go. But as a student that is starting and is uh, progressing at the beginning of your, their career, then that's more than enough to use the simulation in my own case. Of course, the experience with real robot, that's necessary. That's, I would say that is mandatory to do something with that. Then the solution that Jack has proposed is also an, one that I am proposing, actually I recommend in the same robot in my speeches. Hey, if you have the chance to buy this to your students, then provide that, the, the, this JetBot. And I also put even the links to buy in, in Amazon, by the way, in Amazon. <laughs> so, but then if that's not possible because of the money or because of the country that you are in, then use the simulations. The simulations are going to teach you a lot, a lot most of the things that you need, most of the things. Of course, the final thing about the physical robot, that's also th something that needs to be learned, but it depends on your situation. Mm -hmm. Then 
if you don't have this chance to have the real robot, the, we have launched it uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, a real robot lab that we are providing this experience. So it's as close as you can as having the robot. We recommend buy the robot and then you will have it and you will be able to do this experience. If not, use the simulations as much as possible. There is a lot to do there and to take from there to learn. And then if you need the, the extra mile for the real robot experience, use this remote lab. So that's the, the solution that we will propose. Uh, Jack, would you like to take up next? Yeah, sure. Um, our, our approach here um, is that is that there's an end-to-end -end experience, and and that that experience starts at at the beginning. Um, and, and so we're talking about the ROS file system and what it means, and the nodes and the launch files and so on. So students being able to ground themselves there, begin to get involved with the code. Um, inter-node communication and so on, seeing a node, getting into that code, changing that code, seeing the changes in the robot in simulation, over the air deployment into a robot. So full life cycle, end to end, curriculum driven, iterative exercises, so that when you're done, you can go back to your real life situation and have seen the full life cycle. It may not be the application that you're using um, or, or it may not be the bot or so on, but at least you've seen ROS um, from the start to it actually fun functioning on a, on a physical robot. Uh, Stefan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm of course a little bit too much hardware related. Yeah, to be honest, um, I'm always. Um, I mean, when we started with Ross Summers, we, we really started with uh, more or less uh, like Turtlebot clones or something uh, we could just um, um, generate on our own, uh, because we were not allowed to get something from ClearPath that, that way because they they were still uh, not lead free. You know, <laughs> so we couldn't get the, the the robots imported. So it was a nightmare. So we had to build it on our own. Um, but then we went we as well to simulation. Why? Um, I think it depends really from the application. So if you are running, um, let's say, something which you cannot um, so easily generate in hardware, you definitely have to go to simulation. And the uh, earlier you start with the simulation to get people in contact with the possibilities nowadays, um, and they will definitely solve something in simulation first and then try to port it to the real robot. And I think that is... I think that is agreed that should be the tool chain. And what we found out as well is that some people, they just stick to simulation because they like it much more than fiddling around with a robot and yeah, and the batteries are going down. So that's why we have always two competitions in the, in the, in the summer school that you have a simulation competition and, and a real uh, robot competition. So at the end, um, it turns out that I think still it depends really from the application. And I think uh, we are talking about Ross Industrial so industry really likes love simulation. And I think that is definitely as well something where, um, where Rosen and, and Ross industry should, um, yeah, let's say focus on because a, a very good simulation or let's say a simulation which is very realistic will definitely as well support the acceptance of Ross industrial in the industrial context. Um, uh, it starts with having, let's say, a larger, let's say, collaboration robot, which you cannot afford. Let's talk about 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 euro collaborative robots from whatever manufacturer. And you try first how to, let's say, how you get uh, uh, the kinematics solved and all that movement and so on and your tasks solved before you really buy something for 100,000 bucks. And then you find out, oops, uh, it's, it's not the right robot. So I think... The tuition is with, let's say, the application in mind, with the industrial application in mind, is completely clear. Simulation first, then go out in the field when the simulation is working. That will definitely um, increase the acceptance of Ross Industrial in industry. For universities, might be different. You know, nerds are always, you know, where are soldering around? And so, but I think for industry, definitely first simulation and then getting everything done in the simulation first and then bought it. Okay, boys. Yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. I would like uh, to add something. Is it possible? Yeah, sure. 
uh, yeah, yeah, sure. what Stefan has mentioned yeah, yeah, is that yeah. uh, so before I started the, the construct, I was working at uh, one in industrial uh, robotics institute, and then uh, there were like people had different uh, tasks, and then there were those ta those guys who were about uh, object recognition and vis vis um, artificial uh, computer vision, sorry, and they 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 hated. The, the hardware thing. So they just wanted to have the 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 bags of data, and they say, "Oh, sorry, I'm mean, just bring me the, the the data, and I will do my algorithms and so on." And that's a, an important point in in robotics because at present, most of the robotics programs are made by roboticists, not by computer scientists. And then that's a very important point because. I mean, we know how to program, but it's not our number one. So though, though are, they are better at programming, and but they are kind of uh, afraid of having to deal with all the hardware. In that case, so ROS is so cool, is so great because it allows us to separate both things and provide to those computer scientists that they want to be programming uh, then concentrate on the ROS topics and whatever, for whatever it comes from there. You, you don't have to care about the software. Oh, you want to, to try, then connect a ROS back. Oh, you need something more dynamic, then connect a simulation. That's okay. Uh, so you are in the software world. You are safe there. And that's an attitude that I found there and that maybe we can use this uh, simulation thing for promoting a, 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 in, in computer scientists the 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 possibility that they can join and become a ROS, ROS developer for for robotics uh, by using just software. They don't have to deal with the hardware. 